Welcome to the technical elective and AMP info session for ECE. This is right now focused on what to take for technical electives in the spring semester of 2020 and also in the future. So if you are planning your technical elective schedule, hopefully this will give you some information concerning how to sequence your selections of technical coursework. I usually start by saying, do you know what you're going to be doing for the next 30 years? And it usually, I mean, who knows what's going to happen in 30 years. And because of that, it's probably a good idea to think about breadth versus focused depth at your technical elective coursework or with your technical elective coursework. With that said, you might be thinking about how can you select across many different technical areas as you select your technical elective coursework. We've tried to make the courses decade sensitive, meaning the 20s are sort of the circuits, the 30s are communication, and the 40s are control. That three decade span, the 20s, 30s, and 40s is signals and systems. If you now see a class that's 429, oh, that's a digital signal processing class. It tries to follow what you've already taken for your core coursework. Right now you're taking maybe 220, 320. Those are in the 20s. That's in the signals and systems area. So now if you like those classes, maybe you would be interested in technical electives in those three discipline or in those three decades. Likewise, if you now get into the 50s, that's the electronics, microelectronics, 351C. If you liked that class where you're learning about diodes and transistors, now do you move on with some classes in the 50s? Our computer classes are in the 60s and 70s. You've taken 175, 275, maybe 369, 373. Look when you see a 400, 500 level course and it has its numbers in the 60s and 70s, odds are it's a computer related class. That's the idea and you can sort of see these areas of interest underneath those decades. Electronics, computer, electromagnetics, signals and systems. That's the way that it's tried to be designed, but we ran out of numbers. We only have so many numbers in a decade, and for that reason, you'll see some mismatches with that philosophy. We'll have some tens, but here are the courses right now that are scheduled for spring of 2020 at the technical elective level. 330B, that used to be a required class. Now it's open as a technical elective. That's computational techniques. How do you numerically integrate? How do you numerically differentiate? How do you set up these simulations so that you n can rely or know how strongly to rely on the simulation that you've just produced or that you're trying to create. Computer architecture, that obviously requires that you've had 369A. So some of these classes do have prerequisites and I will try to make available on my website not only a link to this video but also maybe a link to our course catalog in a sense so that you can quickly scroll through those pages and find at least the course description then you should talk to the faculty that have taught that class in the past if you want more detailed information but computer architecture is really the next phase of computers how are they going to be designed do i know how to put the processor, the memory, the networking all together. Can I now build my own computer if I'm worried about parallel processing or multi-core? How do I make that work? That's what you'll start learning in a computer architecture class, probably starting in 369A. 
466, 566. I'm listing these that are dual numbered because if you get into our AMP program, you can take 500 level classes. They don't have to be dual numbered, but you could take the 500 version of a dual numbered class if you were interested in that and count that towards your undergraduate and graduate degree. And we'll get into a little bit more about that, but that's why you see this 4 slash 566. It's 466, 566, for example. Fundamentals of information and network security. That's a lot of cryptography. So if you're interested in how do you make things reliable, either for security reasons or even for transmission reasons, how do you encode the data so that it's secure? And that's now a, using cryptography to as the foundation in that particular class. Principles of artificial intelligence, that's I think sort of the AI1, the computer system knowledge, is sort of the AI2. But you don't have to take one or the other. You can take both, but you don't have to take them in that particular order either. But if you're interested in how do you make a computer think or process information, what are the algorithms behind that, the 466, the 479, those artificial intelligence are the classes that you might be looking at. In terms of the electronics and biomechanical classes, if you're in the computer engineering option, you can take the required EE option courses for technical elective credit. 352 is required in the electrical engineering option track but if you're in the computer, that's what the CE beside that means. If you're in the computer engineering track, you can take it as a technical elective. And that now gets down into the electronic level of how do diodes work, how do transistors work. In 351C, you look at a more systems level approach. 352 gives you the physics behind that. How are we moving these, str or having things work in this structural arrangement at the atomic scale. Device electronics 352. Digital VLSI, very large scale integrated systems, how do you make digital logic occur on a manufactured printed circuit board or in a, not a printed circuit board, but in a chip? How do you design those? Measurement and data analysis, 417, 517. I think those two classes, 407, 5, and 417, will be taught by the same instructor in the spring semester, Dr. Rovita. She's going to be now teaching the measurement and data analysis. So if you wonder how do you monitor or apply sensors to a physiological system to your body, what are the wearables? How do, you, how do those techniques work or technologies work? Or in a hospital, you're, you're now covered with sensors. How do, they, how do those work? Creating those, that's part, a part of 417. The electromagnetics track or optics coursework. Again, here's a course that is in the EE required option but it can be taken in the computer option. And this is the electrostatics, magnetostatics. How does this, how do Maxwell's equations in a sense work when things are static? If you go to dynamical movement of electrons and electromagnetic radiation, then you need a little bit more than 381A, but 381 gets you started with the static understanding of electric fields, magnetic fields, etc. 404 optical spectroscopy of materials. How do you understand what you have based on hitting it with electromagnetic radiation? If you now, in a very crude sense, shine a light on something, What's absorbed, what's emitted, can you now tell what you actually have physically in terms of the material properties of that object that you're radiating? 
photovoltaic solar energy systems, that's 414A. Again, these are the spring 2020 classes. That teaches you about how do you create a system that will take energy from the sun and produce the energy that you would like to have it in in the form of electrical energy. And there they're not only worrying about just the generic solar collector or solar panel, but now how do you improve upon that? How do you enhance it? How do you improve the efficiency? Or can you make a device that's not as critical in terms of facing directly to the sun? Can you actually put directionality into your device so that now maybe it looks vertical, but now it doesn't really matter where the sun is. It's now capturing a fair amount of the energy that's impeding on that surface. Antenna theory, how do our cell phones just keep getting smaller? They're still communicating. How do you do with, an how do you create antenna arrays? How do you make antenna to B in receivers and transmitter configurations. That's 484. Then the last few decades are digital communication systems. How do you communicate digitally? How do you now make sure that what you want to send, you encode it properly so that it, when it goes across the channel and the channel could just be the airwaves. Now you put a signal in, you encode it, you receive it, it may not look exactly like what you put in, but if you know how the channel influences that signal in the transmission, you can now decode that or figure out what was intended to be sent. That's digital communications. Digital control systems is now worried about sampling signals that you are going to be using in a control environment if you're trying to control any kind of device, be that a vehicle. The vehicle could be an autonomous vehicle, it could be a normal vehicle, it could be some system in your home or some system in an industrial plant you're trying to control it. How do you do that digitally or how do you create a computer or cr create an algorithm on a computer that would allow you to control that particular system. That's 442, 542. As you're planning your material or your selection of courses, I'll try to put these slides on my website so you can find these, but you can see that we have more courses than we have time slots and you'll want to then <clears throat> see if you can in fact identify courses that you want to take that aren't in conflict time-wise or day-wise. But here you can see that we're trying to minimize the number of courses in a particular time interval. And I've also included the 500 I don't think you can take 600 level courses as an undergrad, but you can petition to take 500 level courses, even if they're not dual numbered. If you now want to take, if you have a strong enough GPA and you are a senior, you can then petition to take a 500 level course and you could count that towards your undergrad or grad, depending on what works best for your schedule. And this just gives you a way to maybe better map out what you're interested in versus, oh, there's a conflict. I wanted to take those two. Okay, now you're going to have to make a decision on which of those two did you most desire to take. That's for the spring. In the fall of 2020, what's anticipated is really what we're living through right now. This is just a replication of what's happening in the fall of 2019, but you can now see that you have many options for computer-related coursework. If you're in the electrical engineering track or option, you can take 369A, the computer architecture, or you can take object-oriented object software design 373 as technical electives. Numerical modeling of physics and biological systems. How do you 
model, not just electrical systems, but now biological systems, mechanical systems. How do you put those into a simulation? 413, web development and Internet of Things, IoT, that's big. Now how do you create the infrastructure, the web design, the web development, so that you can now collect the information that you want from these things that are out there that are connected to the Internet. And that could be all sorts of, use your imagination, what is now connected to the Internet and how do you want to use that information. 472, I believe that actually if you take it as a 472, you're supposed to be in honors. This is now what's all this technology in the medical arena? How do you design, model, and simulate maybe a robotic surgery device or something else that's in the medical arena? And you just go into the hospital and you can understand how technology is now everywhere, not only there but in other venues, but this is specifically dealing with technology in a medical environment. 472. 474A, digital or computer aided logic design, that's a follow on to 274, but it's obviously the next level or the next stage in that development. If you want to understand how computers are networked together, that's 478, 578. How do you create a network of computers and make it effective? In the electronics bio area, there's the microelectronic manufacturing and environment. How do you build these devices? What needs to be considered? And now, obviously, we have to worry about everything being clean or green. How do you make that happen? 434, how do you deal with the electrical and optical properties of materials? How do you work with that? 450, that's now a continuation really of 351C. The next level, now maybe you were working with individual elements like individual transistors, now can you stage those or put those into an input stage, an output stage, an amplification piece, all of that now is what you might be looking at for integrated circuits at the analog level. Dealing with a certain frequency range, microwave, how do you design circuits now we've just been assuming that these circuits work no matter what the frequency range. In microwave engineering one, you're dealing with passive circuits. How do you design systems that actually function the way that you want them to function in that particular microwave frequency range? I don't know if 459 will be offered next fall. It is being offered now, but again, that's if you want to understand optics, what's going on in the optics area from an electrical engineering perspective, that's your ticket into trying to better understand something about optics relative to electrical engineers. Then you have the signals and systems classes digital signal processing, Z transforms, you're going to learn if you haven't already, Laplace transforms in 320, you'll be using those. Well, their twin in the digital setting is the Z transform. That's used in 429, it's used in 442, which is the digital control class. How do you now go into the frequency domain and use those tools? 430, optical communication systems. Now how do you make sure that you're dealing with optical components? What communications issues need to be addressed or worked on? And 441A is the analog control systems. How do you model a system? Mechanical, electrical, electromechanical. Electromechanical just means generators and motors. So now 
or that's one way of thinking of it. How do you control this interconnected set of systems to behave the way that you want them to behave? And again, the weekly schedule is provided. You can see that a lot of classes are scheduled on Tuesday, Thursday in the middle of the day. So you might have to be more selective in your choices in terms of classes that you might want to take there. Typically classes are prerequisited as if you were starting in the fall and then taking the subsequent one in the spring. So if you're sort of starting in the spring with your technical electives, you want to be very careful and cognizant of what you're trying to do relative to ordering your courses technical elective wise. Are there questions on technical electives? If not, we will move into the next phase, which is talking about the AMP. We're in ECE, so we have to talk about AMPs. Now, this is the Accelerated Master's Program, and this is, you could think of it as a four plus one. You spend four years, let's say a traditional student at the undergraduate level, and one more year you could now earn your master's degree. And the way this works is it actually allows you to double count. You can take up to four classes, 12 units of coursework at the undergraduate level that are actually graduate level courses that count towards your BS, but they also count when you get into your MS, they will count towards your graduate degree as well. You can now be thinking about this as a junior, but obviously you want to be thinking about this before you start your senior year so you give yourself enough lead time to potentially take the classes that you want. You have to have a GPA of 3.3, that's your cumulative GPA. The GRE, the graduate record exam, is waived, so you can now not have to worry about taking an exam, the graduate, the GRE exam, to get into the program. But then once you've reached 75 units, that's midway through your junior year, you can now apply to this program. Yes? That's not units at the University of Arizona. The question was, is that units at the University of Arizona? That's a good question. I think it's essentially, if you've transferred in 60 units, then you would have to have completed 15 at the U of A. So it's, it's basically saying if you transfer in, you're, depending on how you transfer in, but let's say you transfer in from a two-year institution and you've now completed all of your freshman and sophomore courses somewhere else, those will be counted towards your 75. Yeah, you don't have to spend four more years trying to get to 75 units in order to take advantage of the four plus one. So you can, if you're a transfer student, still participate in the AMP program. You apply, you can't start taking classes until you're actually a senior. So once you've reached 90 units, then you can start taking these classes that are graduate level classes. You'll now count them towards your undergraduate degree. Obviously you would have to finish in good standing with your BS. If you don't, then they won't transfer, you won't be able to continue with your masters. But if you stay at the necessary performance level, which is you maintain that 3.3 or better GPA, you can then immediately move those up to four classes in towards your 10 that are required for your master's degree. And your master's degree could be either thesis or non-thesis. It could be a coursework only master's. If it's a thesis, then you don't take as many courses. You take eight, but now you have thesis units. It's not quite as predictable how quickly you can finish if you're doing research towards a thesis. 
So with the coursework only MS, it's a little more predictable. Now you have three classes in your two semesters after your BS to get your master's degree. Three courses each semester, if you've taken the up to four as an undergrad. If you're interested, then I would suggest that you see the graduate advisor and have sort of a one-on-one -on -one exchange with her so that you can start thinking about how do I plan my movement through the technical elective courses, hopefully, well, at most take four of those that will count both ways towards your BS and MS. What have I failed to mention or do you now have questions about the AMP, the Accelerated Master's Program? Again, it's a designed to be a four plus one. It's fairly clean in terms of the process. You have to satisfy these admission requirements, start your coursework as a senior, be successful in those four courses, and then you can continue with your masters. If you, yes? So the question is, what's the difference between a 400 level and a 500 level class? It's course dependent. It depends on the instructor for that class, but there does have to be something unique for the 500 for the graduate students versus what is in the undergraduate. So it could be a project that the undergraduates do not have to perform, that the graduate students have to perform in the 400, 500 level class. It could be an additional problem on an exam. It could be extra homework problems. It depends on the instructor what distinguishes, but there is some distinguishing feature between the 400 and the 500. And you could talk to the instructor and say, I'm interested in this class. How do I decide whether I want to take use this class to be counted towards my AMP, or do I just take this class as a 400 level class? And then it would obviously just be counted towards your undergraduate degree. Did that answer your question? So it, I, I don't have a clear-cut answer. It's going to depend on the class and what each faculty member decides they want to differentiate between the undergraduate and the graduate. Other questions? We're all hungry. It's time to stop and then we'll take it offline, correct? if you have questions that you don't want to voice on air.